Thank you, Jens. And it's, it's always a highlight, or it has been of recent years, a highlight of the year to come out here and do this course in person. And those who elected not to do this in person are missing a real treat, um, both with the, uh, the interaction, personal interaction in the room, and, and obviously the hospitality of uh, Jens and Seattle Science. So um, this is a bit of a teaser uh, because those of you that tune into the orderly arthroplasty triumphs and tragedy session, um, this is kind of a short version of what I'm going to be talking about a couple weeks uh, from now. And what got me interested in this is kind of the, the, the thought of arthroplasty 2.0. So in other words, there was a literature of hip and knee replacement arthroplasty decades ago. And once hundreds of thousands got these were done, we started to see a, a finite incidence of those that needed to be revised. And while the, and you'll see, while the incidence of the necessity for revision in cervical is less than that of hip and knee replacements, um, with the hundreds of thousands of these being done now, we, we know that there's going to be not an insignificant amount of revisions that need to be done. So it's kind of become an interest of ours at TBI since we're starting to see a fair number both internally, because um, we've done a lot, uh, and then uh, through patients that, that, that seek out kind of the, the alternatives and, and what to do when, it, when a disc goes wrong. Um, so we're trying to figure out, and, and this is just the beginning, hopefully, of a literature of, you know, scientifically, why do some discs fail? Why do some patients fail? Uh, and then what's the best option for keeping these patients function intact, whether it be with conversion to fusion uh, or, or, or motion of, of actually a revision arthroplasty, just like a revision hip or knee arthroplasty. So um, with that kind of foundation, um, I'm going to talk for probably about 20, 25 minutes uh, because that's what I've been assigned, uh, about this topic and uh, leave some time for discussion because it, because it is an interesting topic. It's new. There's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot that we're learning. Um, every six months, we seem to be learning something new. <clears throat> so in, in analyzing the kind of the etiologies, the reasons um, for failures, uh, what are they? Obviously, uh, surgeon or technical error, including patient selection, which is always number one on everybody's list. Uh, we've got to look at the biomechanics of different devices, uh, biological reasons for failure. We're starting uh, to see some, some C. acnes infections and osteolysis and such like that. Metal allergies seem to be more prevalent, maybe just because we're asking about it now. Uh, implant migration um, and, and other reasons, post-traumatic failures of discs. So, uh, I didn't do that. It's, oh, let's just put it down here. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as arthroplasty surgeons, both us and, and the, everybody else out there that has adopted this technology should be aware of the types of failures and really have a strategy for addressing these situations. So by way of introduction, we were trying to figure out, okay, what is the rate of TDR removal or revision? And we went back uh, to our case series back all the way to when we did our first IDE case back in 2003. Uh, so we've got 20 years of data looking at our own internal captured data, whether it's single level, double level, triple level, hybrids, whatever. Whenever you put in a disk, uh, we were able to kind of capture a denominator, which is something that very few series out there uh, ever give. So about 1,470 patients uh, being with our experience. And you know, to, to get to the quick, uh, there were 20 cases or an incidence of 1.36% of revisions or removals. And if you go by devices, uh, it, it's 1.1% because we, because obviously we do a fair number of multi-levels and things like that. So, you know, with, with that data in mind, we can really start to compare to the other arthroplasty literature, shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, et cetera, and, and really see kind of where we stand and, and, and what we expect going forward will be kind of the load on us to do revisions. Um, so based on this, we, 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 
wanted to analyze all the revisions that we've done because you can learn a lot just from retrospectively kind of analyzing why discs needed to be revised and, and what you did. So you know, we, we looked at all our revisions or removals uh, done at our, our clinic. Um, and we used the definition uh, of the FDA guidance document for removal or revision. And based upon uh, those definitions, uh, we examined our surgery logs of patients who underwent removals, revisions. We looked at some demographics. We looked at the reason, duration, and subsequent procedure performed. And um, you know what we found was um, the the demographics. You know, the, the only thing that was surprising is that we seem to have more females than males, which did not really correlate with kind of our overall demographic. And as we get into this, I'll kind of give you a reason why I think that might be uh, the case. Uh, but in our series, the mean time, 37 months in the range, obviously uh, immediate when you had to reposition something, um, you know, a day or two after to out to 216 months. So based on that, we were able to add another cohort of patients. So we're up to 42 patients. And since I put this data together, we've had two more and we've got another one coming up in a couple weeks. So the, the cases are adding up. Um, and in 31 of these patients, the disc was removed and converted to an ACDF. But in 11 patients, they were able to, we were able to maintain motion and either reposition an existing arthroplasty uh, in one patient uh, or rather convert to a different arthroplasty device, which um, I find to be kind of an interesting uh, way to look at the, you know, and really study the biomechanics of different devices. Um, these are done very safely, unlike the, the horror of having to do an, a, a lumbar revision anteriorly. Um, everybody's experienced with doing revision uh, cervical uh, surgeries. And the, the surgeries really all went as planned, um, except in one case, um, the, the, the disc was, was templated in, in a different device, a better fitting device was put in. But really, what you plan to do, most of the time you can do. And, and obviously, with, with any good surgery, preoperative planning uh, is a huge deal. All right, so removals for revisions. And, 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 and this you know, initially opened our eyes. And the most common re reason was osteolysis. And osteolysis is something that uh, has been uh, become more and more prominent. In fact, I was uh, teaching a, a Zoom uh, disc replacement course last night, and four of the six surgeons were in their first year of practice. And one of the surgeons said, what, what's this deal about osteolysis? We seem to be hearing more and more about it. And so you know, it's starting to become a little bit more um, at least talked about. Um, you know, uh, other reasons, and you, you, can, you can see here, um, we, I don't have our data at this point, but we just started a study looking uh, at symptoms arising from posterior cervical pathology, people having to have not a disc revision, but maybe a foraminotomy. And, and that was in the, in the Rush series, Frank Phillips series, that was the most common reason for failure. So we'll, hopefully we'll have some data on that in the coming months as well. So to, to give an example, this is a, a typical osteolysis case in some ways and atypical in the others. Most of the cases that we've seen with osteolysis um, are because patients have a symptom, arm pain, neck pain, swelling in their throat, things like this. But this is not unheard of as well, which is an asymptomatic osteolysis. And this was an IDE patient, which in the course of being followed with the required and requisite one-year follow-ups, started to have some radiographic changes. And there's also an interest in defining, uh, re remodeling, uh, due to stress shielding versus pathological osteolysis. And I'm going to get to that. There's a really good study out of Europe uh, that, that looked at that as well. So, you know, this is a troubling radiograph, but with no symptoms. This patient was followed. MRI showed, you know, no, you know, obvious soft tissue mass or abscess or anything like that. And, and really, at this point, this was pretty early. c wasn't really on our radar screen. Um, but we kept following the patient, and the radiographs kept getting more and more concerning. And, and uh, there were uh, four of us that were in investigators in this IDE, and we, we put our heads together and, and said, you know, we really need to look into this further. And we decided to get a CT scan. And at that point, you know, we didn't really know what we would find. But now we know that the CT scan is really the way to diagnose 
uh, physiologic remodeling versus osteolysis. And, and this is patho pathognomonic. This is, this is absolutely spot on for osteolysis. Peri progressive periprosthetic cysts, um, it, it, it fits the, the FDA definition um, or the NIH definition of osteolysis. So, you know, again, patients doing well, it's hard to convince them to have a revision when they're not having symptoms, but we were worried about the biomechanical stability uh, at this segment. So the, the device was explant, explanted, in, and the devices that we've explanted um, all seem to have the same failure mode. All the devices have failed, usually, in fact, predominantly with disarticulation of the polyethylene strands from, from the metal end plate. Sometimes the core stays in place, sometimes the core pops out and is sitting in front of the spine. Um, no obvious purulence, but, but just some kind of nonspecific fluid in front which we went ahead and cultured. Uh, the surgery is pretty straightforward. Take the device out, curette or burr out the cysts, and, and provide stability by doing uh, a fusion. Uh, the pathology was consistent with an inflammatory response with, with perhaps uh, some wear debris. Uh, and in fact, um, it did grow out acnes, and, and we can talk about you know, how we treat that pharmacologically, because that's somewhat controversial as well, whether to, whether to consult ID and go with their big guns or, or just treat with doxycycline oral, which, which is kind of what we've gone to at this point. Um, another very common example of cases that we've seen for revision uh, is this concept of hypermobility. And this seems to be more pre prevalent in women. And I think that's maybe why we're, we saw in our overall series more women revisions because um, this, you know, it, we, you know, we've you know kind of gone to this concept of thin, thin-necked, hypermobile women um, maybe need a little more constraint in their discs. Um, we can thank uh, Pat, Dr. Pat Warden and, and, and my partners who worked on the biomechanical paper that he presented at NAS last year that at least provides, I don't know that it's going to become a white and Punjabi standard, uh, but he, in his biomechanical studies, defining hypermobility as more than 15 or 16 degrees of motion, which is what I've used in, in, in the clinic to kind of measure these patients. Um, it may become the gold standard. Who knows whether that's going to be. Uh, but this patient also had symptoms, and you know, just because the disc is hypermobile and routine follow-up, again, if they're not having symptoms, you know, we treat the patient, not the x-rays. But this patient had symptoms um, and was uh, revised to, you know, people throw around the term constrained, more constrained, less constrained. Again, there's no definition for that. How about, um, you know, a device that has a single uh, uh, point of mobility as opposed to uh, multiple points of mobility? I, I think, um, you know, that, that kind of makes more sense to me. Uh, but most people consider uh, the, this is the original pro disc. I call it the OG. You'll see the new ones tomorrow. Uh, but, the, but the OG is a great revision disc. This was the paper I was talking about um, from European Spine Journal that looked at periprosthetic bone loss and made an attempt, and I think a pretty accurate attempt, to define pathologic versus physiologic. And this was a systematic review, and it differentiated different types of bone loss and compared it to osteolysis. So periprosthetic bone loss, they found, was common, occurred early, didn't require intervention, and you know, it, it was kind of a byproduct uh, of, of Wolf's Law, basically, stretch shielding. Osteolysis is pretty rare, occurs later. In their series, more than not, the patients required reoperation, and they felt in this paper the etiology, metal sensitivity, infection, mechanical failure, wear debris. I think this is a pretty spot on paper. Uh, this was a case report, which is interesting that you know Todd Albert can get a case report of something that we have a dozen or so of these cases into JBGS, but because he's Todd Albert, he gets it. You know, I've never gotten anything. Everything I've ever submitted to JBGS, they've gotten rejected, but um, this was a very typical uh, a case with osteolysis. This was an expulsion of a core and a and a C acnes case. You know, again, you know, n not not uh, something we haven't seen before. Fortunately, we haven't seen this, and this is a case report 
um, from a neurosurgery journal, and this was again a, a failure of a European implanted uh, device. And unfortunately, the wire became loose and went into the spinal cord, and you can see caused a very significant spinal cord uh, contusion or more spinal cord injury. Uh, they took it out, and the, cord, and the wire was disarticulated, and that's the one that penetrated. This, they called it the intradural portion of, of the failed disc. Um, I've not, knock on wood, I've not seen a failure this, uh, this harrowing. All right, let's talk about size a little bit. Um, you know, again, this may be something that, again, swayed our revision series to females because certain implants just don't have, and it's usually the, the earlier implants didn't have smaller sizes. This is an example. This was a PCM disc um, that was done. This was a, a, a TBI case, um, and the patient, um, whether it displaced anteriorly was too big to begin with, I, I would just say it's too big to begin with, uh, and the patient was symptomatic. And again, this was revised to the OG, um, and the patient did fine. Um, disc height. So let's talk about disc height a little bit. In addition to footprint, disc height you know, needs to be paid attention to as well, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but you know, while restoration of disc height of a collapsed segment is the goal, there are potential problems with over-distraction, and, and as we've gotten more comfortable with the technology, we've used them on more older spondylotic patients with collapsed discs, and not all of them need to be restored to a 20-year-old disc height. Um, this was you know, a, a, a cadaver study um, that you know, basically kind of reinforced what we see clinically. If you put too big a spacer in, the facet joints get distracted. Um, that's okay. Uh, this study out of Asia found distraction of a disc space uh, or over distraction was associated with an increased incidence of heterotopic ossification. Um, another study looked at footprint mismatch and found that undersized implants can lead to problems as well, subsidence, loosening, HO, on, you know, again, I don't understand that, but, uh, or just biomechanical failure uh, based on l load. This was a study I was talking about before um, on, on height matters, and this is, this is Rick, Rick Geyer's paper, and this was based on the data uh, from the Simplify IDE, and it looked at uh, disk space height uh, levels and found that a majority of them had heights less than four millimeters. And early in the one-level study and for the, for the totality, I believe, if I'm correct, of the two-level study, when the four millimeter became available, it was uh, used uh, much more frequently. And I've found that in my practice, uh, it's most of the time in women I used the, the four millimeter. Um, and then in the very collapsed disc, when you don't want to over distract. Uh, so the four millimeter has kind of become a game changer. And again, you know, it, it, this is kind of advanced arthroplasty, picking the disc to fit the patient. Um, Obviously, we need to have a plan to readdress uh, the uh, reops. Uh, disc to disc is feasible for some patients. Some patients require ACDF. Uh, the most common in our study was osteolysis. Um, other authors have found that as well. The Australian, there's two Australian papers that found a high instance of osteolysis, and uh, which necessitated an implant warning in Australia uh, for the uh, uh, M6. Um, many patients have some degree of osteolysis post-disc replacement that doesn't develop into a clinically significant problem. And, you know, when we see these type of scenarios, we recommend, as we do with all our arthroplasty patients, routine yearly follow-up. And if, you know, issues arise, um, we'll, we'll, we'll work it up further. And this is kind of the, we're working on um, a grid to work up these patients, and this is really rough. We're just putting this together. Uh, but suspicious x-ray, we'll get a CT scan. Asymptomatic, if it's mechanically stable, we'll just continue to observe. Uh, if it's progressing or if it looks like there's not sufficient mechanical stability that you're comfortable sending out that patient to lead a normal life, you might recommend revision as we did in that case that I showed. And if it's symptomatic, uh, we remove the disc and do an ACDF. And always culture for C-acnes. Um, and, and as you know, C acnes uh, requires holding on to your cultures not more than the 48 hours. It's usually two to three weeks. Although the last case I did 
um, culture positive for SACNES in four days. I've never seen one that quickly. Interesting. So general strategy um, with osteolysis, clearly, I think doing not doing a disc to disc, but converting to an ACDF. Um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that just curating out or burning out the cysts and creating mechanical stability is what cures these patients. We feel better giving them six weeks of doxycycline, but is that really a game changer? I, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, if mechanical stability and good end plates you can preserve when you're doing these things, then I think a disc to disc is a very, very feasible thing. And there are certain scenarios, hypermobility, uh, disc migration, as long as, they, as long as you've got end plates, uh, I think it's a, it's a really good salvage. Um, last year they were here, but I want to put this in here anyway. This is for our friends down the coast in LA. What about motion restoration? Uh, this is a rare scenario in our center. I think we've done an N of three. So the LA people are much better to talk about this than me. Uh, but I'll show a couple cases, one that went well and one that did not. Um, this uh, was a patient who had, uh, as you can see, a non-union with what appears to be relatively uh, well-preserved end plates. I think you go into these cases, even if you're going to try to to take down a non-union and do an arthroplasty, you tell the patient that there's still a pretty good chance you're going to have to do a fusion because I, th I think finding pristine end plates in this scenario is pretty rare, which is why it's at least it's pretty rare at our site. Uh, but again, um, we were able to revise this one and mobilize the disc and, and restore motion. This, this was uh, not as pretty a case. And this is a long story, but I, I'm going to try to make it shorter. Um, this was a 48-year-old female who had a herniated disc, got better, got worse, uh, and eventually underwent an ACDF. Patient did well for a little bit, then developed recurrent arm pain, and had a new herniation below it at C6-7. So uh, one of our partners, uh, this is again an in-house case, one of our partners uh, said, well, you know, it's a perfect patient for an arthroplasty at C6-7, um, you know, but it's got a non-union at 5-6, so why don't we just revise it to a two-level arthroplasty? And technically, it looks like a pretty darn good job. Patient did well for a while. And then the patient started to subside and has symptoms. One of the problems with taking down fusions, uh, it's really hard to preserve good end plate. Um, so what do you do next? We turn it back into a fusion and, you know, triumph of technology, let's do an MIS fusion with the D-Trax. Let's do that one. That's going to work, right? Well, it did for a little bit. And the patient started having pain again, and flexion extension films showed motion, so it didn't really heal. So the next step was, OK, uh, let's do a wiring. So wired the patient, did a posterior cervical, formal posterior cervical fusion. Well, patient did well for a little bit, and then didn't. And uh, the wire broke. Or no, the spinous process broke. It cut through. So now you're on this patient's like re, 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 revision. There you go. And they finally got around to taking the arthroplasty out and re, re, refusing at uh, C56. And uh, at this point, that's the end of the story. But uh, my partner is going to keep me abreast if there's another if there's another chapter to this story. But. Anyway, to summarize, the rate of cervical TDR revision removals is low in our series, 1.4%. Uh, be aware of C-acnes and have a revision strategy that's going to work most of the time, hopefully. So that's all I got. Please work in. Sure. Uh, Scott. Um, thank you very much. A, as I told you before, it's a great talk. A question about um, C. acnes and revising disc to disc. Since you're taking a disc out and culturing it, and then that culture is not going to come back for a couple weeks, and now you put in a new disc, um, you know, so far we haven't encountered a problem with that, but are we fooling ourselves? Is C. acnes just an opportunistic bug and it really has no nothing to worry about? Or if we should worry about it, should we worry about putting another disc in? 
You know, in, in I know in one of the Australia series, I don't know about the other one, um, they didn't culture for Siakmes at all. And whether they did disc to disc or revision to fusion with no antibiotics, they, they didn't, they all resolved. So I, I'm kind of leaning towards that. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of literature coming out. I've seen a couple systematic reviews recently um, in the, uh, the revision scoliosis world. Um, they call them un UIPC, unanticipated intraoperative positive cultures. Uh, there was just a systematic review in uh, NAS Journal, and then one just got approved. They were accepted for publication in European Spine Journal with the conclusion is, well, we see it a lot, but we really don't know what to do with it. I mean, it, it, I mean you do a lot of revision surgery. Does that change your approach if you happen to get a, a late C. acnes culture? It's such a great topic, and I want to credit again you and also Izzy for having brought that much higher to our attention. And yes, it is an unresolved issue. I have stopped surgeries on this, Frank pus in there, but uh, exactly the scenario of having no obvious pus, but then having suspicious um, tissue then later grow out is a big problem. And then we bring ID and, and obviously patient disclosure. So in Frank pus, I would debride, I would put antibiotic beads in, I would stage, maybe put temporary hardware in, which is what I've done, and uh, then replace that later with a formal fusion. But those patients are not in good shape. My question to you is again, C. acnes, uh, are there any tip-offs outside of the very generic radiolucency that you can share with us? Any SED rate, CRP, anything that's just a little bit helpful, procalcitonin, something? Zero. That's the problem, is serologically, you do the workup pre-surgical in any revision patient, and you got nothing. So that's a problem. Um, now, and I used to not do this, now I, I culture even some of these hypermobility, non-osteolysis, and the last one I did, culture positive, for, and it was pristine bed, and I just cultured it, and two weeks later the culture came back for C. acne doing a, a, a MOBI, I think, to simplify revision. I don't know what to do with the info. I mean, I, you know, I've started now just saying we're going to go home on two weeks of doxycycline until we get the cultures, and if they, they're positive, we'll go the whole six weeks. But you know, again, you know, I'm sure an infectious disease doc would roll over in their, you know, would have a, a conniption over it. But you know, we we surgeons. Hey, Scott, I think there's another area that we're going to start to see increase as more and more people adopt disc replacement, and that's an inadequate decompression. For example, I have an upcoming case. They put in a MOBC. The patient had cervical stenosis, and he said, yes, I decompressed it, and I think I showed you the case, but the patient's spinal cord is down to a couple millimeters. And, you know, I think that, you know, the... Uh, maintenance of motion or doing the arthroplasty for motion is great, but you have to remember it's a much more meticulous operation. You have to do the decompression. And just like in our series, we don't have a whole lot of posterior phragmonotomies. We do have some, but I don't think that we have any central decompressions that were not adequate. And that's an area that I think we're going to see more and more of. And and just one last point about the C. acnes. You know, I understand we don't understand a lot about C. acnes, but exchanging it for another disc, the, it, we don't have enough data to know whether or not that's a smart thing to do. Now, if we were in L.A., then we would, wouldn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, the cervical fusion is not such a bad thing if it's one level. I mean, we're not talking about fusing four and five levels. But if they do get an infection, the safest thing, at least in my mind, is still to do a fusion and, and be done with and not worry about it, not worry about getting your CTs and seeing osteolysis and all the other things that can happen. Scott, a question about the disaster case that you showed that, that had to be revised so many times. Uh, you know, we've, we have not used BMP in the neck um, since the FDA came out with a warning and, and case reports started to pop up. But, um, you know, the other dictum in, in our, our kind of surgery is uh, you're a fool to keep doing the same operation over and over again, hoping that it'll, you know, you'll get a different result. So is this a case after doing, you know, the third or fourth time trying to get an interbody to heal um, where uh, you might want to use, if, if it was your patient, uh, BMP? Is there any circumstance you'd use BMP in the neck for? Well, one, one of our outside of U.S. surgeon friends 
uses a small one fourth corner of a, of a small sponge and uses it routinely for cervical fusions. I mean, it's got to be we you know it's it's dose related, but um, we just were foolish enough at the beginning to just put in a you know a sponge, and that was more than the biology could handle, I think. But are we brave enough to do it in the U.S. now? I'm probably not. Yeah. Although, if there was maybe ever you go to auto, maybe you go to the Yoak Crest. Maybe that's the yeah. what you should do. Hi, I'm Neil Patel. I'm one of the fellows of Dr. Chapman. Mm -hmm. um, we were at a conference recently, and there was. A, a case about kyphotic deformity and then placement of uh, arthroplasty in mm -hmm. there to correct it uh, with top plate a little further back to kind of get some lordosis. I just wanted to get the group's opinion on um, creating lordosis with arthroplasties and, and the indications and thoughts behind that. You know, as, as we're doing more older patients, when the... When, in, every place in the spine, lumbar, cervical, when a disc space collapses, you lose your normal lordosis. What do they call it? Aging is a kyphotic condition. Is that what they call it? Aging is a kyphotic condition. Would I treat a global kyphosis with the disc replacement? No, but you know, if you've got a couple flat discs, you're going to, I mean, by definition, you've lost your normal cervical lordosis. My experience, and we'll hear from the other guys, is just doing your distraction and putting in an arthroplasty, the soft tissues tend to restore your lordosis. A couple of the discs do have lordotic end plates. Anecdotally, I've used them and I don't really see that they're any better at restoring lordosis than just getting good mobilization of disc space and distraction to, you know, whether it's physiologic or just short of physiologic disc height. Would you put an ADR in for a fixed segmental kyphosis, though, Scott? I, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's the issue. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a structural multi-segment kyphosis, the answer would be no. Or if it's fixed even at one segment, if it's you know, not moving on flexion extension. Yes, that's, that's a great point. I don't know. Now, granted, th this is not the severe kyphosis that maybe was implied, but a lot of times when patients have cervical radiculopathy, you'll see they have kyph kyphosis. What they're trying to do is to bend their neck forward so they're not, so they're taking the pressure off the nerve. So mm -hmm. those patients, I don't have any, and I don't think any of us have any question about doing them, but um, a little bit of kyphosis, as Scott said, once you restore the disc height, you can reverse it. I'm not saying we will correct it, uh, but at least you can get them back to neutral. Yep. Thank you. Uh, not to bring it away from the discussion about kyphosis, but you sprinkled in a few times, uh, you talking about the more and less constrained and axes, axes of freedom with these arthroplasty and how that, uh, affects our failure rate and the considerations in osteolysis. Uh, and I guess in my thought, maybe I'm, maybe I misheard or maybe I misunderstood, but to me, like a more constrained in plate, you have greater surface area, you have more osteolysis and by being more constrained, you portend, uh, towards more loosening at the junction of the implant and the bone. And so I guess how much do we understand if, if at all from, from data collection, uh, when we use like these more free implants versus the constrained implants, if osteolysis is our main mode of failure in these and the more free implants are, are doing well, uh, I guess maybe just for me buckling down on that a little bit, uh, if, if that makes sense. No, no, I know what you're saying. And I think interestingly enough, much like in the hip literature, mm -hmm. I think osteolysis is a wear debris problem. It's a reaction to wear mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the, the degree of freedom or the, or the mechanics. I think osteolysis is biologic reaction to wear debris. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's why it's seen more frequently in, in just that give off more wear debris. Um, so you know, I, I, I know where you're, you're getting with it, but, and, and, and frankly, technically, when we teach these things, we, you want as much end plate coverage as possible. Right. Um, the, the biology of, of the titanium mesh that all these discs have are really good. I haven't found a disc that, you know, has more loose end plates than another. They all stick, believe it or not. It, it's a very, you know, favorable environment for bony on growth, um, more, even more so than lumbar. Um, but I think the, the osteolysis issue is, is more based upon mechanical failure and wear. 
Sure. Yeah, and, and there's certain discs that are going to have a higher incidence, but like the fixed core, for example, the pro disc, but the granddaddy of them all, we see very, very little. There's been a few cases reported, but you know, very, very rare to see that instance. So it's not really a matter of shear. I think it's what Scott just said. It's really a matter of wear debris. And, um, you know, fortunately, it's, it's very, very rare. And, you know, I think certain materials are more predisposed to it, though. Does I, because I don't I don't really know the engineering in some of these discs as well as maybe I should as a spine fellow. Um, is the is the constraint coming from contact on the poly or is it coming from a metal articulation? I mean, I'm sure it's different from device. It's a right? as I mentioned in the talk. It's a, yeah. it's a definition we've thrown around but never defined. Yeah, you know. So, for example, the pro disc has you know one area of motion. Mm -hmm. ball and socket. The Moby has a pretty unconstrained core, although it does have constraints within the, I don't remember whether it's the top or the lower end plate, mm -hmm. but it seems to move more than, for example, the Simplify. It's just, just has like a millimeter or so of motion in the tray. So, you know, constraint, uh, uh, I don't know what that means. No one's ever given a great definition for it. Even if you ask, like last year Lisa Ferrara was here, she couldn't even define it. Because there's just not enough agreement. Yeah, but to respond to your question, it's the the poly and the or, and the um, end plate. That motion is pretty friction free in, in all the implants. So what what uh, Scott's describing is is what happens between that nuclear you know part of it and the lower end plate. And some of them are fixed, so that eliminates that extra motion. Others, like the uh, Scott will show us the Charité tomorrow because he was the investigator for that. It was just a biconvex saucer. That had you know no constraint either top or bottom it was friction free, which in the lab looked great and got everybody excited, but in the body um, was really tough to um, control it. Yeah. It had to be put in exactly right, and you know patients had to be straight up and down. So you know in between those two extremes are the ones that have some motion of that nuclear port, whatever it's made of, and some more, some less. Um, and you know the, the so that's where the the difference is in um, range of motion and allowable range of motion are from device to device, and we're just scratching the surface. This is this is new new technology, new science for all of us. Even though we're twenty years deep in it, um, we are just peeling the onion layer by layer. And you know what's nice is this is another layer that we're we're starting to explore. Well, thanks. Uh, excited to have you guys here. Thank you. You know, the other thing to consider, uh, Scott showed our data, which was 1% revision rate, and that was with, uh, what's the, the length of time, Scott? It was up to well, 20? Well, we only followed patients that we had two-year follow-up on, so it was two to two to 20 years. Yeah, two to 20 years. So that, that's not 20 years total, but if you look at the total knee and total hip literature, the normal revision rate is between 4 and 5% at 10 years. So when we first started doing these artificial discs, at least in lumbar spine, we thought, well, if they last 10 years and we have to do a revision, not a big deal. It is a big deal to do a revision. But what we, we found was that our revision rates are extremely low compared to the traditional hip and knee joints. So they're very, very durable and beyond what we thought originally. The case that you showed um, was concerning. There was obviously something not right. But one of the biggest problems, and I'm speaking as a disc arthroplasty fan, is when we have patients who are unhappy and have continued pains, how much do we validate that pain by sh uh, looking more and more at pain generators and, and eventually more studies? How much do we kind of just sit down and reassure them? The difference, as we know, to a fusion is a fusion is a fait accompli, and it's mm -hmm. fused, it's fused, for better or for worse sometimes. But the disc arthroplasties have this burr of continued motion in the mindsets of anxious people. And so I'm just wondering, uh, how do you find the right balance of reassurance, interventionalism, um, investigations, et cetera? No, that's, it's a great Unanswerable question. I mean, as you know, it just comes with experience. You try to be very reassuring, but if they keep coming back, you, you've got to start working on pain generators, whether it's if it's radicular pain, nerve root blocks, if it's axial pain, uh, facet blocks. Um, again, the, the folks down the coast like using CT spec to see if that, you know, no, no real good literature on it, but if it, if it gets, if it's hot, 
then they feel like that's a pain generator. Um, I know that when the lumbar discs first came out, we always said, okay, well, if, if you're hurting, you weren't a good disc candidate, we'll convert you to a fusion. And if, in our experience was the same as in Europe, because we compared with the European surgeons who were doing arthroplasty 10, 15 years before us. And we found that when we converted a patient who was symptomatic after a lumbar disc herniation for just pain alone, no other reason, they did well for three months and then they had their pain. And the European surgeons who did arthroplasties way before us found the same thing. So it, probably if, 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 if you're treating the axial pain component, it's kind of what you got. And, and yeah, we'll still work up pain genders and do facet blocks and nerve blocks, things like that. But, you know, of course, here's another question. You know, maybe you have an indolent C. acne's infection, but you don't have a way to, to diagnose it except by doing a revision. How about no. that? <laughs> I don't know. No. How was that for a non-answer? <laughs> no, no.